This is the Board of County Commissioners agenda setting. This is a regular meeting. It is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. It is 9.23 a.m. The session is set to go until 12.15 today. We're at 3000 Pacific Avenue, room 110. For public virtual attendance, you may follow along on the Thurston County YouTube channel. I'm Carolina Mejia. I'm the chair of the board. To my right is Vice Chair Ty Menser. To my left is Commissioner Gary Edwards. Also in the board room, we have County Manager Ramiro Chavez, as well as Assistant County Manager Robin Campbell. We'll start our agenda today with uh, homeless strategies. Good morning, Commissioners. Keely Marino with Public Health and Social Services. Um, as you are aware, the legislative session for 2023 has wrapped up and um, Washington Low Income Housing Alliance did send out uh, a rollout of uh, a rollup of what um, came from this year's session. So I'll give you just a really quick breakdown, um, not by bill, but by um, uh, awards and investments. So uh, $400 million has been set aside um, for the Housing Trust Fund, which is a number of different projects and programs that are um, underneath the Housing Trust Fund umbrella, which I'm, I'm happy to, to share with you at a different time. Um, there's $40 million has been set aside for land acquisition to um, acquire land for affordable housing to be built. Um, uh, $14.5 million for shelter and housing for homeless youth and young adults. There's $6 million for preservation and investments in manufactured housing communities. And $60 million for infrastructure which is what, that is needed when building new affordable homes. Um, in the operation operating budget, uh, they're they're included an eight percent increase in the aged, blind, and disabled cash grant, um, so the ABD cash grant, um, which is really helpful. Uh, a permanent ongoing increase of twenty six point five million for the housing and essential needs program, which is also um, called PEN. So that is a significant increase that is dearly needed um, for that program. Um, overall, there's a 6.5 increase for homeless services, um, which is a $45 million investment, and that is in the frontline provider workforce. So I believe that Senator Macri um, has really been pushing for uh, homeless service providers that are on the front line to get a pay increase. And so that's what that fund is for. Um, there is a $5 million for eviction prevention and increased funding for tenants' rights to counsel. Um, and then, and, and then also the governor's uh, and the governor's budget that was approved seventy five million dollars for right of way continued right of way um, activities. So um, seventy five million for the next two years. So per year seventy five, um, one hundred and fifty all told, um, and then thirty million dollars for the next two years. That breaks down into fifteen million dollars for projects that are not directly right-of-way projects so for instance at the wheeler encampment on the on the on the i-5 side that is department of transportation right-of-way the nickerson camp right across from that actually belongs to the city of olympia with that 15 million dollars that could go towards um nickerson street as well so it can go towards um encampments that are not directly on the right-of-way in right-of-way communities and that is um all I have for the legislative wrap um, wrap up, and then also tomorrow is the Regional Housing Council, um, and that will be at 4 p.m. Um, it will be online, and it, uh, citizens and residents can go to um, the Thurston County Regional Housing Council website and register to attend and register to make public comment if they desire. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Questions, Commissioner Mansour. Uh, on this right of way, seventy-five million. So, how would that affect what we're doing from the previous allocation of funds? Is it just continuing that work, or now we have now we're going to go get another hotel? I mean, you know, what is it expansion of what? that's all about or is this just kind of continuing on because we have the project you know with that we started with up at Hobbs Prairie? It will be a continuation of operations um, for what we have already so that will be the operating costs for the hotel in Lacey and that will also be operating and development costs for the Franz Anderson tiny home project and then ongoing with outreach and at this um, time Unity Commons also receives funds to set aside beds for right-of-way so those will continue on. 
But I think it. But I think it's it is going to be another round of proposals as a result of this new funding. Meaning, mm -hmm. sorry. No, go, go ahead, because this is statewide, statewide. And, there, and there is a lot of uh, jurisdictions that perhaps didn't have the chance to secure funding from the initial 60 million. So I believe the $75 million is going to be another round of proposals. So mm -hmm. certainly Thurston County region will be uh, positioned to request additional funding for the ongoing operations. But correct me if I'm wrong, if you know that $75 million is to continue to fund the already strategies they were they were funded under the $60 million. But again, uh, that was not my understanding. Yeah, I, I have a bit clarification on that. We, um, My understanding is that for sure it's for ongoing operations for the next two years um, and then also maybe site improvements, um, abatements, and, and the like. Um, I believe that the right-of-way will remain... I. I, I will check in on that because my understanding is still the five communities that have already been identified for the right of way project. Okay. So um, I will I will get clarification. Thank you, Keely. Oh, um, my question is, do you know if Southport Financial, if they were kind of had requested some funding through through this or were they in a separate grant? Ah, uh, that's separate. That that is not right of way. Oh no, I was I was talking with the legislative wrap up that you. Just oh made. oh oh oh! I'm sorry. <laughs> I do not know that. Um, I'm just looking at this. Uh, uh, Washington Low Income Housing Alliance wrap up. Okay. That was my question. I was just uh, wondering if we knew if we got. Funding for their project or not no, in the housing trust fund um, set asides the there is no. I don't see Southport, so at least in the housing trust fund that they did not receive funding. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we'll go uh, to our next item. Uh, just for the public, uh, our meeting for today uh, at on April 25th at 2 p.m. is canceled. So next we'll review the Board of County Commissioner's draft agenda for a meeting of May 2nd, 2023. We'll call the meeting to order at 2 p.m. The Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Vice Chair Menser. Approval of the Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023 agenda. We have two presentations that day. The first one is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month Proclamation. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, this is a yearly um, event, an opportunity for you to highlight uh, the heritage of the Pacific Islanders here, uh, residents in Thurston County. I believe we have already um, secure uh, members of the community to come and be part of the proclamation. Jimmy, what are the names? Yeah, I have the um, program director confirmed with the Asian Pacific Islanders Coalition, some other members of their organization to attend and accept. Thank you. Any questions for Jamie? No questions. Okay. So then we'll go to our second presentation. We haven't had two in a row for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, a two for a bike to work month proclamation. Yeah, and again, this is also a, a yearly um, event, and the board um, has the opportunity to declare May 2023 as Bike to Work Month in Thurston County. Um, in the past, uh, Chris Hawkins from our staff used to attend that. He's an avid bicyclist, but unbeknownst to me, he resigned and he's working for the state now. So I don't know if he's going to be able to join us. Uh, just learned that last week. How about well, Bruce? Bruce Rangel, huh? Yeah, good luck with uh, with uh, all your new uh, endeavors, uh, Chris. So we'll probably need to find somebody who can probably help us. And yeah. I had I actually had an inner city transit employee reach out about the proclamation, provide me with the updated draft. So he is confirmed to attend and accept on their behalf we'll, as well. We'll see somebody from staff. Well, Bruce is does he a lot of writing from out the, the shop. Totally. Yeah, we can probably bring Bruce. Ask Bruce. Uh, Rorba? Yeah. Okay, I'll check with him. Thank you. Make sure I should write their bikes to work that way. <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't worry, Commissioner. I'm closer than you are, and I'll still probably be later than you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and there will be an op any questions on that proclamation? Okay. Then there will be an opportunity for the public to address the board and county manager's update. I don't have any specific updates planned, but if something comes up. No, yes, I do have one. I will highlight that we just received the, uh, from the County Road Administration Board the, um, the Certificate of Good Practice for Public Works. And I will make the point of highlighting uh, that, how that really is a benefit to the county, Public Works, and, um, and continue to uh, see the Certificate of Good Practice. And this is our reflection. Of the of really the good practice the public works does related to uh, managing the roads and the gas tax associated with um, with the roads. So yes, that will be my highlight. Any questions? Okay. Next, uh, we have consent items A and B. Item three A. Uh, this is uh, to reappoint to the storm and surface water advisory board. Yeah. For your considerations to reappoint Mr. Britt uh, neighborhood uh, to the Stormwater Surface Advisory Board for three year term with uh, an expiration date of May 2nd, 2026. And I believe the board uh, reviewed this and concurred in bringing this item for your formal action. Any questions? No. Okay. And item 3B a one time financial retention bonus. Yeah, this is a resolution for your consideration based on the, the conversation you had last week and, um, and uh, given all the uh, non-represented employees here in Thurston County with a one-time retention bonus. Um, they, I just received a copy of the resolution. Um, the language may change a little bit, but uh, it is uh, aligned to what the board already provided direction. This is your formal action uh, for you to consider this, um, the one-time bonus and, um, and that will be, if approved, next week will materialize on the employees' checks affected by this action on the May 25th uh, pay cycle. Any questions, Commissioner Edwards? No questions. Commissioner Rensser? No. Okay. Uh, moving on to department items. Items 4A from the auditor's office is approval of the voucher list. Line up chair with your uh, uh, there will be a new item that will be coming up to your attention department item next week. And this is related to the recent, and I will give a little more explanation on the legislative action. Um, uh, through the legislative process uh, under the capital budget that was approved, um, there was a, um, we worked with uh, the uh, local um, uh, legislative uh, delegation to allocate funds to the three runabouts. Uh, on 507. Well, that's what we call the bypass in Yale. Long story short on this, um, you know, two years ago, uh, there was already an allocation of $75 million of, uh, of, uh, on the capital budget. The majority was to continue the efforts of the Nisqually, the replacement of the Nisqually River. There is a lot of work associated with, uh, with that project and that is moving forward. But last year, uh, the, the, uh, the remainder, which is about $21 million, to construct the three runabouts on 507, that's the bypass in Yelm. It was on the risk of losing it. So this year, we engaged with, again, with the local um, uh, uh, the, uh, legislation, uh, legislative delegation, and uh, we work on uh, proviso. Uh, they will incorporate it into the capital. Their proviso states they allocates $21 million to the construction of the three runabouts on, on 507. And they also, the, the proviso allows for um, the local jurisdictions to deliver those three projects. The three runabouts is one is 507 and 702, that's in Pierce County. And Pierce County uh, will be part of that delivery of that project. The next runabout, I think, is the, uh, the runabout that access downtown Yelm in the city of Yelm will take the lead on, on performing that road, uh, that construction in, in 
in design and construction. And the other roundabout is 507 Avail Road. And that is uh, stated on the, on the proviso that Thurston County will take the lead on that. The reason for this proviso was the DOT, uh, when they were approached during the legislative session, didn't have the capacity to deliver those projects in a timely manner. So the, um, uh, the representative for that district, Representative Barkas, approached Thurston County to see if we can probably be part of that solution. So that is coming, um, and it will be in the order of just about $7 million the county will receive to deliver that project. There is a lot of uh, uh, urgency to that. So the item, item that you will see next week uh, for your consideration is to set a public hearing to amend two documents, the couple of improvement programs, the CIP and the TIP. And that is an urgent matter. Uh, and we will ask the board to consider waiving the 20-day common period to go with the 10-day uh, common period. We need to position ourselves to uh, uh, do the work this year as soon as the, uh, uh, this is signed by the governor, uh, the budget. So that's the proviso because the proviso also includes so that within 80 days of approving the budget, DOT needs to give and relinquish all that information to the local jurisdictions. So the local jurisdictions can start the, the, uh, the design and construction of those three runabouts. And that is the, the intent of this uh, proviso. Any questions? And the item that you will see is to set the public hearing. Okay, questions for Mr. So basically we're gonna kind of do like we did down at Highway 12 with the Grand Mount, yeah. with Sergeant Road. Yeah. Only the state's going to kick in some money instead of... No, they, actually the state is fully funding. Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah. so they're paying us back for yeah. doing everything down there. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. So by taking the lead, as you put it, I think that means that we oversee, like we put out an RFP and have contractors and we just make sure that it's getting done. Right. <coughs> going through. Right, right. So that exactly as, as, as you described, it will be the, the normal process that you sue any uh, road project delivery process. Uh, most likely in this case, we'll hire a consultant to help us on the, on the design of the runabout and then we'll go through the right of acquisition permitting and eventually construction. Um, any possibility that that construction might be this fall? Uh, no, no, sir. Next because the uh, the uh, five hundred seven and Vale Road is one of the roundabouts. The hasn't the state has not done much, so we need to begin the process from the beginning. So I will hate to give you a timeline until we understand where we are on that particular project and work with Public Works to give us a uh, perspective as to how the timeline of Did delivery. Did the state do acquisition of property for that project, though? I, I do not, uh, perhaps for this segment, yeah. not necessarily for the runabout. So we need to understand okay. the, that this is just uh, something that just came up as a result of the legislative session. Sure. Good news for the county, and I think that put in the position of the county to, to be proactive on, on delivering those projects. And I really appreciate the uh, uh, Representative Barkas reaching out to Thurston County and to give us the opportunity to work through the details. Um, at some point, um, you know, it was uh, whether we can deliver all the three runabouts that created a lot more complexity with Thurston County, <clears throat> considering the one is in Pierce County, and just the amount of work would have been too much uh, in order to meet the, the timelines. The divide and conquer approach, that was the, we help uh, in providing the language uh, and the proviso, and that has materialized on, on how that in, ended up being. So, uh, and, and along the way, uh, you know, we'll have the opportunity to highlight um, other items on the legislative agenda, but uh, Deborah Mangia has been pivotal in helping us go through this process. So. Is there a timeline on the money? The, in the next biennium. So we have to get this project done before the next biennium. I think is the the uh, the uh, similar to the upper funds, the the uh, the funds will be obligated. So we need to have in con uh, under contract by, by that point. Yeah, so that's so my understanding. So this project will go kind of like a little off the list just because of the timeline on them. So along the way, uh, and you know, one is amended the CAP, one is amended the TAP. 
and also we need to amend the, the budget. And, uh, and as part of the presentation, you will receive on Tuesday morning. A brand new item that just came up, uh, but in those, we try to align all those three elements into a single action, not a single action, but con consecutive actions. Yeah. yeah. And the TIP must be a unanimous yeah. vote. Might be, might be. Huh. With five commissioners as well? Uh, yep. Specifically says unanimous. Unanimous. Yeah. That is an amendment. <laughs> <laughs> no amendments to the TAP has to be unanimous. Approval of the TAP is normal process. So we'll be doing that later this summer, this summer, uh, actually, earlier than we'll better, remember, early the, we'll, we'll, sooner the better. We'll try to expedite this because uh, you know, now that we sort of uh, made it. We need to deliver. <laughs> I think that we're adopting the budget amendment on, I want to say, June 6th. I'm going to have to check that date. But that means that everything for the CIP and preferably the TIP will all be ready to go as well on that same date. But if the board um, uh, um, approves setting the public hearing and waiving the 20 day uh, comment period, uh, public notice to 10 days. Most likely, we will have the public hearings on the third week in May for both uh, documents. And that will align to when you consider approving the budget amendments in early June. Further questions? <coughs> okay. We'll, we'll move on to community planning and economic development. Item 5A, interagency agreement between Washington State University and Thurston County. Before you go to that uh, item 4A, Madam Chair, as the budget list for the week of um, April 10, 2023 is yeah. a department item, and that is for the total amount of uh, $2,290,541.21. And there are some, continue to be some small expenditures related to the attendant improvements here at the atrium. Okay. We're coming to... Winding up. Winding up, I'm sure. Soon. Okay, um, now to community planning and economic development, uh, the interagency agreement between Washington State University and Thurston County. Yeah, and, and this is a yearly uh, uh, item for you to consider, and this is a uh, uh, interagency agreement between Thurston County and the Washington State uh, University Extension, and this will be for the 2023 calendar. As you know, the, um, the extension provides valuable services uh, in coordination with Thurston County to uh, the residents of, of the county as a whole. And uh, this uh, particular agreement is for $173,072. And again, for the calendar year 2023. Uh, at this point, we're not asking for any budget uh, increases. This has been part of your approval process when you approved the budget back in December 2023. And again, this, this is just consolidated in the document uh, to keep moving forward on the partnership. Josh. Thank you, County Manager. I think you said it all. We appreciate the continued great partnership with WCU Extension and the work they do in our community. Thank you. No questions. No questions? No questions? No questions for me. Um, okay, item 5B. Thurston 2045, local vote. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and this is related to the um, uh, direction that you provide back in um, April 18, 2023, to develop the 2045 uh, scope of work. There is two, uh, two main groups. One is the required elements uh, uh, to ensure the plan complies with the state law. And there were six uh, strategic uh, optional updates the, the board uh, approved to move forward. Um, those six um, uh, optional updates uh, is the, implement the implementation plan, future land use updates, incorporating countywide industrial uh, land study findings, climate change elements, economic elements, and the health elements. And again, for, uh, in this particular item, is just you to formally affirm the directions that you provide um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Maya? 
Thank you, County Manager. I don't have anything to add. I appreciate all the board's work on this so far. Thank you. Questions, Commissioner Adler? Sure. Commissioner Manager? No questions for me. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate that diligence on approving this uh, by uh, taking this formal action will allow the county to access uh, grant funding uh, through the state, and that is important. Um, money on the table. Yeah. Um, okay. Emergency services, item 6A, waive bidding requirements to contract with United Way for individual assistance. So uh, let me frame this item um, uh, a little bit uh, differently than the uh, previous items. Um, so we receive a grant um, uh, from um, the state um, individual assistance grant. And that was related to uh, Senate Bill and gross uh, substitute Senate Bill 5693, which allows individual jurisdictions to partner with a, uh, um, an agency to communicate and outreach and determine eligibility for households in affected areas uh, uh, when, uh, for damages and repair costs when an emergency occurs, such as uh, flooding. So um, there's have been a couple of uh, uh, interesting steps that I'd like to uh, uh, bring uh, to attention to the board. Um, we came across that um, the previous manager signed an agreement with United Way to provide those services for the amount of $25,000. Um, I believe that uh, we uh, had the understanding that perhaps uh, they, uh, uh, before signing that agreement, would receive uh, three formal quotes. Um, where we cannot find an evidence of receiving those three quotes uh, in order for uh, the, that agreement to be signed. So that agreement is signed, and that agreement has the performances from uh, December uh, 26, 2021, and lapses in uh, June 30, 2023. So uh, by not having the three quotes in place, it gave us pause. Um, they, uh, uh, as to how we can probably bring those holistically in order to be in alignment with the procurement policy uh, that we have in place. So this is uh, for your consideration, is uh, to waive the competitive bidding requirements uh, for this contract. With that action, if you consider well aligned and, uh, and will avoid any potential findings down the road. Um, in, in this case, you know, um, I extend my apologies. There's always so much going on in the county, as you can imagine. Uh, we try to be diligent in everything that we do, and unfortunately, some things just falls um, uh, within uh, the context. This doesn't, uh, it, it makes it a little more complicated because the, the previous emergency manager is gone. We don't have that evidence as to how that came to be. Um, but here we are. It, hopefully, we can uh, make a, uh, uh, the right steps and in, in, in for you to consider taking this action. So uh, that is the extent of my introduction to this item. I want to add our sincere apology that we're bringing this up after the fact as well uh, and just reiterate the fact that we're well aware of the procurement policy. We have the evidence regarding the ask that was made for three quotes, but we don't have the three quotes uh, that we can find on the back end. Uh, and with that, it's in the, our best interest to bring forward self-report and try to rectify the process moving forward. And so this is this is that rectification. Questions, Commissioner Edwards. And have we done this with United Way in the past? Yeah, I think United Way has always been a partner to help us determine the the, the assessment, the damages. And, and somewhere and, along the line, we went out for bids, right? Right. Yeah. So this is, but it's, this is a brand new contract, and we need to secure the three codes. We don't have any evidence of securing those three and, codes. And this is okay to do this with yeah. the internal auditor. Right. That this is, is the advice that the internal auditor gave was to take this action. Yeah. To make it whole. My recommendation is for yeah to bring this on the consent agenda for next uh, Tuesday. But if you certainly like to have this as a presentation, we'll do so. 
normally this would be within the director's signing authority and it wouldn't right. come to you, but um, since we can't uh, produce the evidence dollar amount the quotes, under 50,000, yeah. yeah. Okay. But since we're asking for the waiving right. of the, uh, the competitive bidding requirements, you need to take an action on this. Okay. And consider the circumstances that we just outlined to you. So we'll bring this in the consent agenda for next Tuesday. Thank you, commissioners. And I appreciate your diligence on this and understanding. Okay. Item 7A, information technology renewal. Share your plug like every time I show up, I just yeah, have to spend more money. <laughs> sure, it's taken the front of this. This is, again is uh, for you to consider a uh, one year extension of of the renewal of the support for the Questica uh, application. Questica, as you know, that is the uh, uh, software that we use to prepare the budget, has been very effective. And the reason as to why we asked the board to extend for one more year just to make sure the ERP is in place as a budget mo module uh, within the ERP. I can't remember, is it the EPM? What? The EPM. EPM. That eventually will replace uh, Questica, but uh, we need to expand. Uh, we need to make sure that we have enough time so we don't just stop Questica without knowing uh, the ERP, as we know, is, is facing some delays. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're working on those delays. We're working with uh, GFOA at this point just to help us navigate through some of the the gaps that we have on the implementation of the EFD. But again, hopefully we don't need the entire year, but this is a uh, uh, whole year's um, request. It has a cost of $66,891.86. And again, this is already included in the budget, so we're not asking for additional appropriation. Sherry. <laughs> That's pretty thorough. It's kind of continuing extortion. Is that what it is? Uh, I will not use those words. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I know you're. But, you're but, more, I, I, uh, but I understand. I, I understand the meaning of that comment. I mean, it's just ongoing, right? It's yeah, not. It's, it's ongoing. not going to go away. Okay. Well, it should go away well, by the end of the year. That's well, the. Well, we caught up. <laughs> That we'll have our seven items, and, you, and we will have a public hearing at 3.30. Um, this is a public hearing for open space tax program update farm and agricultural conservation lands eligibility criteria. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for your consideration, you have two actions uh, next Tuesday after the public hearing. One is to close the public hearing. Uh, depending on the public testimony you might receive next Tuesday, you may consider taking an action to uh, pass the resolution amending the open space as presented from its, to you from its staff. If um, if the uh, there is enough uh, significant public testimony that you'd like to further discuss that, we will make sure that um, we schedule a follow-up briefing for you to have the opportunity to discuss the public testimony. But again, uh, this is the second uh, action uh, for you is an option, uh, depending on on the public testimony. Okay, questions? Did the Planning Commission have a recommendation on this? Uh, this didn't go to the Planning Commission. Um, and uh, Ashley can elaborate a little bit more on this. Um, I think, yeah, we didn't go through the Planning Commission on this open space. Yeah, thank you. Um, because this falls outside of the Growth Management Act, um, this, um, this proposal before you was reviewed at five work, work sessions with the Agricultural Advisory Committee um, rather than the Planning Commission. So the recommendation that you have is actually from the Agricultural Advisory Committee. And I take it from yourself. From the staff. Staff work, yeah. <laughs> Questions for me, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I will conclude our agenda for May 2nd.
Uh, next item is proclamations and awards and advisory reports and submissions. And I'll pass this to Jamie. Uh, good morning. Outside of what's already been reviewed for the uh, proclamations and awards, I have no further updates. Um, for boards and commissions, the standing applications have been included for your review. Um, the Black Lake Special District is recommending appointment of Kirk Van Landigan for the vacant position they have available, which was the new applicant that they did receive. Um, for the Agricultural Advisory Committee, they provided no appointment recommendation. Um, when I requested one last week, the chair indicated that the committee has no current openings for the student appointment and that their understanding is there's a process the board would go through to create the position before the committee can provide a, an appointment recommendation. I'm not really sure where the breakdown in communication is on this with them because the chair of the committee didn't raise any concerns prior to me asking for an update on their appointment recommendation last Friday, and they've had this application knowing that I'm waiting on that recommendation since the beginning of last month. Um, I did receive a request to remove a, re a member from the fair board. Um, the letter sent to the current sitting member was included for your review. I also received a reappointment request to the Citizens Commission on Salaries for Elected Re Officials and two appointment requests to the Veterans Advisory bo Board. Both are recommending appointment and reappointment as requested. Outside of any questions, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, and then I would like to give some perspective on the Agriculture Advisory Committee because I was actually went to the last meeting. I popped in for a little bit. Um, and I, I was surprised that they were discussing the, um, you know, well, they were discussing adding to the bylaws, their bylaws, the student, the ex-official student appointment. But then they were also discussing adding um, an additional non-farmer member. And I was, but this was like back from the discussion that commissioners had, I think it was in February when we were discussing the appointment of uh, fellow Waxwing and- uh, Schoenbachler. And, and, yeah, and I was just surprised that they were just now discussing it since we were, we were I thought the situation was done and over with, the commissioners had decided that uh, since Gigi McClure ended up leaving, we didn't need to add an additional position. That was just a recommendation. I, it was my recommendation. Um, and and so I, I felt like they were a little bit behind the eight ball um, in terms of, of discussing this. Um, so I, I agree with Jamie, not sure where the break in communication is. Um, my recommendation, Jamie, um, is to let them know that the board has already created the ex official position okay. um, and that there is a student appointment um, who's applied for months now. Mm -hmm. And we would like a recommendation. I wouldn't want to lose interest of a young person because he hasn't heard back from us. Mm -hmm. uh, and if possible, reaching out to uh, to Nathan and letting him know that uh, his application will be considered next month. Or okay. Just to make sure that he's still interested since he, he has been... He definitely is. He reached out yesterday and I did let him know that you guys okay. were going to be reviewing it today and I'd provide him with an update this afternoon. Great. Thank you. No problem. Um, and, and so I just kind of wanted to give that perspective because I did attend that meeting and I saw those two motions being discussed and I was I was surprised. So you're saying that they want us to create a student member position but we already did it? We already did it, yes. And they wanted to create and, and the reason they wanted to create an extra non farm position was to try to accommodate the person that we already accommodated? Yes. Like back in February, and so they were discussing that, and I let them know that the board, that was a recommendation from the board back when we were trying to appoint those two members, and um, we don't need them yeah, but since Ms. McClure ended up leaving, then we were able to fill those two positions, so... When she did depart, I did provide them with an amended letter that you guys had amended the appointment from an ex-officio to a non-farmer seat for her, um, uh, it was Miss Waxwing. Um, so both, uh, I believe it was Greg Schoenbachler was um, appointed to the empty seat. And then when Gigi left, then uh, Miss Waxwing was appointed to the other non-farmer spot. 
So there isn't an additional ex officio position unless another one is created. And I don't think that the, my understanding was that the board was re actually requesting one be created. It was at the time you were going to, but then when Gigi left, then Ms. McClure was, or Ms. Waxwing was able to fill in as that other non-farmer seat. And that's when you guys had discussed creating like the student position, ex officio seat. A press release was put out at the beginning, I believe it was March 8th, that we were recruiting for student applicants, which is where this application came from for this board as well as the fair board. And um, I believe is what was put out in that press release. And that was, um, okay, and, and then the proposal is we go ahead and make the appointment. Because we have one opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've only received one thus far. All right, well, I guess I do have one. So, and we're just going to put something on the consent deal for uh, the fair board. Because yeah. apparently that person hasn't been meeting yeah, no, for, like a year. for a year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Is, um, are the commissioners okay with my recommendation for Jamie to reach out to the Ag Advisory Committee, letting them know that? Yeah. Ex official position has been already created by the board, uh, and that this there is an app, and we'd like to hear from them by their next meeting. What app is this? What do you mean? Oh, Mr. Nathan. Oh. He submitted his application. I think so it was early last month. Yeah. It was shortly before their meeting last month because they didn't have a chance to go over it at last month's meeting, which is why we waited for this one. B13. So we would want to get their two cents. Yeah, I agree with Commissioner McKee. I don't, this guy looks super qualified and we would want to get them uh, Point it as soon as we can, unless there's a problem that we're not aware of. Tonight, no FFA and volunteer experience and. Okay. And did you want the fair board removal added to your consent agenda for next week then? Uh, Yes. Okay. Well, that's a yes for me, Commissioner uh, I guess so. It's just a little odd. There's there's five positions open and three at large. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a burning need the way there is when there's actually somebody, you know, that's not attending and holding up a position. Anybody that applied for the fair board has a chance to take one of the three at-large positions. I, I don't know what's going on with Mr. Haney. I haven't spoken. I know him. I have been spoken to him in probably a year. Mm -hmm. So I have zero idea what's going on. But uh, I can It's just you. a lack of attendance. I don't think there's anything going on. Yeah. Because I've been to some of their meetings. Yeah. It's, I've never heard anything bad. Just not there. Well, if you give, we'll have him, six, so. give me a week and I'll send an email. Just I have Mr. Haney's email. I can ask him if he, what the why he is, if he he may want to be removed. Okay. And then maybe I'll have a little bit better perspective. Just since there are three open at large positions, maybe he'd rather resign than be removed. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Right. Maybe. Okay. 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 They always get that opportunity. That's mm -hmm. good. Um, and then Citizens Commission on Salaries for Elected Officials, Carrie Rando, is she one of the ones that are, is included in the action? Uh, no. 
No, this is a separate one um, that's about to expire. This is outside of the uh, auditor's office appointments is my understanding. So this is the, um, I can pull it up really quick to. Um, and I think it's still tough time for that. Maybe we can. Is there, when does our term expire? Uh, give me just one second. I'll pull that open for you. Uh, three, thir it looks like it just expired, 331 of 23. They're the community, he's, I believe it's he, is a community sector representative. So may, may what consider adding his name to your action this morning. Our commissioner is okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So we'll add Carrie Lynn. Can you apply for your agreement? And then uh, for the Veterans Advisory Board, there's two seats open. Yeah, I confirmed. I didn't realize that we had any seats open for that one until these two applications came through. So there are two seats open and two applicants that would like to fill it. When did it, these two seats become open? I don't know. She didn't, I wasn't made aware that we even had them open until, um, uh, like I said, I had the first one from, I believe it was Mr. Frazier came in and I forwarded it to her. Um, Lenny Smilem, I believe, was the contact that it went to. Um, and I confirmed with her when the second one came in, do you guys actually have a seat? Because I don't have it on my tracking sheet. And she said, yeah, we do. We have two open. So. You know, on this sheet underneath each committee, mm -hmm. maybe in parentheses, you could put the number of seats on that board. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like, to give us a perspective of scale, I mean, yeah. Veterans Board, if it's five people, two is a, is, is massive. If it's, yeah. like, 15 people, it's like, okay, well, mm -hmm. you know, the urgency is different. Um, and I don't, I just don't have them all memorized how big they all No are. problem. Yeah, I can definitely update that to indicate the seats that it all, that all of them sit. I don't remember, yeah, but when I advise board, I don't remember them being like one They're of the big medium ones. medium size, yeah. if I remember right. Yeah, and there was, I don't think they had a quorum at their last meeting. So, so it sounds like they need to have the positions filled. So on their, their current roster, I've got seven um, seats listed on it as filled. Um, so it looks like, I think it sounds like there's nine seats total, but I can definitely confirm that. So if they had nine, they would need five for a quorum. And if they've only got seven, then five people have to have seven need to be there for them to conduct business. Probably. Yeah. And I just pulled it up. It is, uh, I can confirm with you looking at what we have on our website there, that it is a total of nine members for this one. Could we get, um, a little work session with our Veterans Advisory Board. Just, I don't, we haven't heard from them in a while, and you know, that's one of the funds that we've been trying to spend down and just see kind of what their objectives are this year and, and just get that perspective from them and um, just get an update overall. But the two folks who are listed on your sheet? Mm -hmm. They're new for these two seats? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and they both their applications were sent forward to the um, Veterans Advisory Board, and they did review it, and they are recommending appointment. Okay. Oh, okay. So we'll fill those two. Mm hmm All right, I'm good with that. You can still have that update. Yeah. I'll, I'll go with that. Yes, thank you. Okay, so then we'll, we're going to move forward with these two appointments, okay. and they can be on the consent okay. agenda. Um, and then the Black Lake Special District appointment. So they switched. Once they, they did switch there. when they got an when they got an applicant. They did switch it from the recommended representative to the actual applicant because they they meet all the qualifications to serve. They. Um, 
And this person just wants to be appointed until there's an election. Yes. <coughs> Let's give them their candidate and get them going. Consent agenda. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, PIO check in. Uh, our PIOs are um, out ill, so no updates. Uh, legislative updates. Thank you. I can, uh, this is the the final report. I have a couple of bills to highlight, um, but uh, let me begin by stating it has been, uh, at least from the county's point of view, a very successful legislative session. Um, the um, some bills that we have highlighted is. Um, uh, page one is 1169. This is concerning legal financial obligations related to juveniles. Uh, since they took the retroactive element of that bill, I think that is a very strong bill and, um, and that has been delivered to the government. Other bills to highlight on page two is the uh, uh, House Bill 1645. That is concerning the meetings of the county legislative authorities. This is just on time. We'll review the, the details of that. I believe it provides flexibility uh, for the Board of County Commissions to meet outside of the county seat. I think it's a monthly basis, I believe. Um, so we'll work on the details, and this is just in time. That, uh, we will bring some the revisions to that ordinance uh, in preparation to the five commissioners that are coming next year. Timely. Uh, the, uh, Subsidy Senate Bill 5358, uh, which is spend, uh, veteran services and programs that has been delivered to the governor. <clears throat> and uh, 5627, uh, related to the salary commission, uh, uh, salary commission for, related to county commissioners, that addresses the five commissioners um, that has been already signed by the governor. Uh, Commissioner Mejia was private all and providing testimony on that. And also um, <clears throat> a couple of highlights that I'd like to bring to your attention. The, um, uh, the court impact fees uh, is already included in the operating budget. The county will receive in the next biennium $2,188,000. That is just about $1,094,000 per year. Uh, and again, I cannot express my appreciation with, uh, De to Deborah Mangia because she has been always putting that finger in the pulse just to make sure this is happening. Good news to us. Um, also, I believe the Ag Park in Tenaino will be receiving $1.25 million for the phase two. I need to confirm, but I believe that was on the last version of the capital uh, budget, and I believe that that's how it was approved. I mentioned to you the 507 and Vail Road already that um, the, uh, we may get close to $7 million out of the 21 million. And uh, this is always helpful just to uh, uh, continue to build infrastructure here in Thurston County. Um, um, overall, um, good session. Um, my personal perspective, the one that I think has been in the news is the uh, House Bill, uh, Senate Bill 5536. The Blake uh, fix did not pass, um, uh, and uh, that has created a lot of uh, issues. We just got an email from WASAC. I need to read it. Um, and I believe um, that some local jurisdictions may take up uh, uh, individual ordinances on their, on their jurisdictions to address the lack of, uh, of uh, guidance from the legislature in this bill. It also it wouldn't surprise me if the governor calls a special session uh, to address this matter. I think he has made some statements related to that. I think he has also uh, said his disappointment of uh, the legislature not coming to a consensus on this very important bill. Um, and um, so if, uh, if it's a special session, that will be great. It needs to be called, I believe, before July uh, to specifically address this. Um, but again, uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll digest uh, the, the, the impacts of this. Uh, I believe we already have a meeting uh, for next week. Um, but the meeting was stated, uh, was predicated, and this bill will pass. Now, since it didn't, 
uh, we have to see how we um, reconvene we as a region. So, because the previous was an interim with a sunset, right? Right. June thirtieth, and right. so and that that creates a big, big issue. So the um, WASAC email um, basically kind of covers what Romero just said. Um, the solution is set to expire on June 30th, so July 1st, 2023. Uh, possession of a controlled substance will no longer be a crime, but other drug-related charges, uh, such as possession and with intent to deliver or manufacture a controlled substance, or the use of uh, drug paraphernalia, among others, will still be valid state crimes. Um, so it's just that um, they, what Wasak was just asking counties to do is, well, just kind of hold your horses while, you know, the governor says if there's going to be a special session or not uh, before counties start passing local ordinances is basically what kind of the Wasak email says. Well, under the, under the previous ordinance that we've been under for, what, two years now, is it? it? You know, locally, I don't know about other parts of the state, but here, law enforcement wasn't utilizing it anyway because it had it had onerous to them tracking. They had to, they couldn't charge it as a crime unless they made two attempts to divert and between jurisdictions, they couldn't, they didn't have the software to keep track of all that. So they really weren't uh, using the law that was there, making this situation less of a change. Then it might be somewhere else where, maybe where they were using that. I don't know if anyone was using that. Um, I think uh, at the next Law and Justice Council, I will actually add to this item on the agenda. Um, I think it's worth just to have that conversation with the law and justice partners, not just at Thurston County, but in the rest of the jurisdictions. Yeah. Big hopes myself from this, this bill. I think it was pretty close to pass, no pass. Finally, I thought at the last day they would not come to a consensus. Apparently, they didn't, so disappointing. Um, I thought there were other important matters in the bill that needed to be like addressed and that this bill addressed. and. Um, And, you know, I felt like while it wasn't perfect, at least it would provide us that kind of next step. Um, and so now I, I'm i not sure kind of what, what the next step is, really. Um, we, uh, me and Sarah were down there that night, uh, just seeing the voting and kind of what was happening and um, had a chance to talk to our legislators about it. So, um, so we got there a little too late. We talked to them afterwards, uh, and we let them know basically that, you know, this was, this was better than nothing really. It was um, important for the county. It was important yeah. for the county. Um, just because, you know, I, I know that there were some issues with it, um, but I think overall, it, again, it was it would provide a solution. Um, and I felt like the concerns could have been addressed at the next legislative session. Um, so, and you know, we talked to our legislators and let them know kind of the county's perspective on this. And um, yeah, it's too bad because the bill it was very robust. Um, they have all their good elements and just came down to the misdemeanor. misdemeanor. Gross, versus misdemeanor gross misdemeanor versus simple misdemeanor. Simple misdemeanor. Yeah, that was really, that was ended up being the, the argument. The, the and they, if you yeah. if you hear some of the representatives stating that that's really, they didn't talk about anything else of the bill. It was just about those, that single element. Either way, I think it's going to have quite an impact district court and so I don't know how we're going to address their situation yeah we, we, we really need to digest this thing <clears throat> see how we can yeah as a county need to come up with 
because if the governor calls a special session, then at that time, I think we need to be a little bit more Correct. proactive and have those conversations. And um, maybe it might be a, a good thing for the Law and Justice Center to kind of give their perspective on it. And or not Law and Justice Center, the Law and Justice Council. Um, and they can That's give their good. perspective on it. It's a good topic for that group. Okay. On this uh, legislative update. Yes, sir. Uh, the 50, on page 3, 5045, that's the uh, incentive for rental of the accessory dwelling unit. Did that affect the county at all, or was that a municipal we, issue? We, I, we need to see um, after the governor signs what the impacts will be. So, so there's a lot of bills more to come. To come yeah. And I guess on uh, page two, on uh, 1337, and is that affecting the county or is that just municipalities as well? So, I thought uh, it was the, UGA. I think that would include the UGA. So we need to see the... the Again, more to... More to come because the bill migrated some of the languages and requirements, so we, we need to reassess what the impact that will be. Yeah. There's a lot of bills in here that we need to... Okay, absorb. do you know anything at all about 5165 talking about the electric power grid or transmission? Do you know anything about that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I wonder if it's some kind of an upgrade to address EVs, or is it a terrorist concern about No, I think plants? it's related to the EVs. It's about the EVs? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any questions? I I do, I mean, we don't really have a person in the county that like goes through all this and figures it all out because they're all different subject matter areas and stuff. But to the extent that a staff member or a department sees an impact, I'd like to hear about that from to the board because, you know, this is the point in this process where, okay, we're done. And then we never hear about it again. And then we find out like nine months later that like something that was passed, like actually is very significant impact. and. But, you know. Yeah, that's what I, I, I intend to do this year, is to make sure we assign to staff to go through, you know, Caglia, we have Rebecca, CPED, and see how all that, and the law and justice partners needs to be part of that as well. So um, you're right, it will be great if we have somebody who can actually see, go bill by bill and determine what the impost to the county will be, but. Yeah, that's not realistic. I mean, but, I mean, law, you know, and again, selfishly, I understand the law and justice stuff, it's some of those, it's all this other stuff that I'm always, I'm like, just, you know, like the one you just mentioned about ADUs and I didn't even see that bill. I don't even, I have no idea what that's about and whether it helps us, hurts us, costs us money. No, I, don't I don't know anything about it, but like, that's the kind of one where, you know, people ask us about ADUs and stuff all the time. So it's the, good for us to know that. The Association stuff. of Counties does do a pretty good breakdown, but there's so many. After the legislative report. But yeah. in, in the last but report, all along we get updates. but even on, on that report, they do a nice job, but, but they don't cover all of them. No. I mean, they, they key on the very highlighted, the one has a big impact to counties. Right, it's, the bills with an yeah. impact to counties. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah, that's good. But each yeah. department should be watching what the legislature yeah, is doing. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm wondering for the appointed directors meeting, because that is a good suggestion, if when we come to the, not, you know, to put this like, do it now, but maybe like two months or, you know, at one of those appointed directors reason. meetings, instead of giving us updates, we can have one that's going to be legislative updates for appointed directors and they can kind of give us one or two bills that they think impact their most, you know, greatly impact their department. I, because I, it's one thing to have, you know, and I do appreciate what WASAC does. It's one thing to get, you know, a hefty report of, you know, and going through. 
it's there's no you know there's no prioritization there's some of the stuff you know may not apply to Thurston County just because of the way we do business it's another thing to have actual on the ground Thurston County staffers say this can affect what I do in this way you know and that is helpful too I mean in addition to just getting the chunky report from Wasac and trying to digest it um, and understand what is meaningful and what isn't. No, I agree with that. It's, I figured it out last year as I was, I think I was texting Jennifer, like, what does this mean? It was, it was something having to do with public works and uh, like solid waste. And I was like, does this affect us? We're voting on it right now. And I have no idea. Like, you know, I'm like, I don't know how I should vote for this because I have on LSC. Yeah. And then, you know, I got on and it's like, oh, it, 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 that doesn't affect us. You know, it's just not how we do business. So it was just like, right, one of those matter. things where it was like, oh, okay. Right. Like all these counties are like going at it. And I was just like, oh man, it's going to impact us. But then come to find out it wouldn't. So I think it's a good idea too, because Wasac covers kind of a wide breadth of all these different counties and they give, you know, a huge report. And while some bills might affect us, others really might not. And having that difference and actually hearing from our department directors and being like, this actually really does affect us. So I really like your idea. Your proposal. It's possible. Yeah. I, mean, I know it's hard, but yeah, like the problem saying that, you know, our department directors track those ones that we absolutely ought to be tracking what the legislature is doing because it did, some bills directly affect what we do every day. Okay. Uh, moving on to briefing public hearing decisions pending. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioners. Last week, uh, Commissioner Messer was absent, uh, but I believe he uh, really struck in what this item is. Um, this is the yearly 2000, and in this case, the 2022 capital asset inventory. And uh, a little bit of a perspective, uh, maybe five years, six years ago, we used to bring all the asset inventories as a briefing to the board and ask the board to approve those. It, has, uh, it includes uh, three elements. It's uh, a list of the assets that we have acquired, the amount we paid, uh, the estimated use for life, that's one element. The other one is the description of the assets, the, um, uh, the disposal that we have gone through because we dispose any, any assets. And also we include the purchase. There's a very comprehensive report that we provide to the board and we provide to the board every year. Well, five years ago, we, a little bit of a change, significant change, and, and really did make sense that change because it was a little bit uh, overwhelming for the board to go line item by line item, department in office, and determine whether the, you concur with that. So within the packet that we provided to you, there is an attestation by the head of the office, the, the offices and, and department directors, attesting on your behalf the individual assets they're under, under their custody. And those letters were signed and uh, as we have done in, in the last few years. I think that brings a little bit more of a context and, and, and gives the board a little bit of assurance that the review has been done at that level. And the attestation has been done at that level, the uh, office and department levels. So this is uh, uh, an item uh, for your consideration to move forward with this process. And uh, with, with your concurrence, we have a letter um, for you to sign. And again, it attests to all the, um, uh, the asset, uh, capital asset inventory that we have in the county. And we have a value, I think, close to $800 million uh, in assets that we own. And it's everything, everything vehicles to pen, not necessarily pencils to office everything is it's just all the everything including including uh, yeah so it's uh, close to 880 million dollars uh, in assets so that's a request for you today I'm good, with it. <laughs> good so we'll circulate that letter and i think the um yeah thank you okay 
Um, it is 1034. We want to take a quick break, or we have the sheriff here. We want to go ahead. Let's do the sheriff. You can take a break if you need to. I don't have any. Right? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Linda, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to. Are, are, did, well, did you sheriff, are you break? staying for the executive session? I can't. I have nothing on my, on my calendar today. Our uh, administrative work day scheduled lunch got canceled because there's so many COVID, COVID cases going around. So, um, yeah. Okay, so Thurston County Sheriff updates. So, yeah. Yes. Well, good morning, board. Assistant County Manager, County Manager. Glad to be back. And before you guys, um, I wanted to give you guys just a quarterly update of what we're doing at the Sheriff's Office, um, some of the issues we've run into, the solutions that we are developing for that. Um, I'm going to start off with the really fun stuff, which is um, our overtime budget for patrol is out of control. Um, we have a substantial concern about what that ending balance is going to look like in December. Um, January, February, March, April are all significantly overspent. And there is a specific reason for this. There's actually a couple things. The first is that um, when I got elected, my only number one priority was to improve staffing um, and recruit and retain people. And we have accomplished that. Um, we've lost very few deputies, and in the same amount of time, we have hired a significant number of deputies. Where we are now is in the apex of we have people hired, so they are, we are paying them a salary, but we are no longer enjoying the vacancy savings. At the same time, we are anticipating that they'll actually be out on the road and serving the public for another year. Um, currently, if we hire someone right now um, as a deputy sheriff, their academy dates are 2024. Um, that is when we're anticipating that they will start the academy is January, February of 2024. And historically, we get dates that are super far out and they bump forward. Right now, we're getting dates that are super far out and they're bumping backwards. So the academy's capacity is getting lower and lower, it seems, um, to meet with the current demand. What we are doing to combat that, however, is because everyone is using the same academy, we are not concerned now with other agencies picking off our employees because if we give a conditional offer to someone but don't necessarily put them on the payroll, if they go and try to get hired on somewhere else, they're going to run into the same exact issue. No one can get in front of us in that academy line. So we're explaining to our new hires that we are going to hire you. You've been given a conditional offer, but we're not actually going to have you join the team and, and receive a paycheck until closer to your academy date. So we're keeping more vacancies open, per se, but they're actually technically filled. Um, another thing that we have done is that we um, are, and this is a tough one, but we're slashing our, our training fund um, for overtime. So um, through the summertime, we had an expenditure of about $38,000 um, in, in overtime that was generated from sending our deputies to training, and we have slashed all but $4,000 of that. Um, while it's going to save our overtime budget and mitigate that, the reality, though, is that you're going to have less trained, less capable deputies out on the road serving the public. So... Um, that doesn't go without its its downfall. And we just got the nasty gram from the union today saying that they, they're not happy with it. So um, we're dealing with that, but we are trying to take substantial steps to cut our overtime costs so that that balance zeroes out at the end of the year somehow. Um, on the other side, the good news is that corrections, as always, is significantly underspent. Um, we have a massive budget that is sitting in corrections. A lot of that has to do with our struggle to um, hire and retain corrections deputies. Uh, specifically female corrections deputies. I can tell you right now that we just got two female applicants um, in our corrections bureau, and we have bumped them all the way to first and second place on our hiring priority. Um, at the end of the year, we are anticipating five female um, corrections deputies retirements, and that is going to significantly impact our jail. Unlike the patrol side of things, you can kind of get away with just male cops out on the streets. You cannot get away with just male corrections deputies. You have to have females in that facility. So um, one of the things that we are entertaining here uh, is at the probably starting in the beginning of fall, we are looking at um, putting out a $40,000 advertisement campaign for recruiting at the jail. Um, it has got to the point where we have so much money in the jail and so many vacancies to fill um, that we are probably going to ramp up how aggressive we are in trying to, to recruit people in the jail. So um, we are entertaining basically any and all options to, to fill our jail staffing. Um, we have gotten the notice from public health that they are removing all of their mandates for our jail. So they are at a point now where they're saying all we have is recommendations. 
while we're still following those recommendations, there's no excuse now. Thurston County Jail is, we are trying to get back up to full capacity for bookings and things like that. So um, that's kind of the, the patrol side in the jail. As far as the jail goes, we um, are moving forward. We are moving forward with um, a device that we've located that can actually, it's like a handheld walkie-talkie, it's called the MX-908, I think, um, that can detect fentanyl um, through air tracing. Um, the cost is $75,000, but once again, we have a pretty large budget over at the jail. Um, the Washington State County Risk Pool has also weighed in. There are potential for them to pay for half of the cost. So we're going through different grant options with them. Um, Department of Corrections in Colorado has used the device. They have stated they have eliminated fentanyl from their jail using it. Um, in addition to this... We can pay for it with our funding. Yes, that was the other thing that we were talking about was, was the ARPA funding. Um, and I think it would be, we're still looking at the device. We want to know, for instance, the ongoing costs. We want to know all these different things that are associated with it. Um, but it does look promising so far. In addition to that, um, for me, the, the drug issue at the jail is not a one-size-fits-all um, issue. So we are also currently negotiating with the union about getting a narcotics dog online. Um, and so those negotiations are underway. There is a training class tentatively scheduled for summertime. So we're hoping to have a corrections handler selected um, and in that class, the dog is free, the training is free, and we have a recycled canine uh, patrol vehicle from the patrol side that we plan on surplusing. And then, so the funds are pretty much covered there. We've got that covered in house. Um, outside of that, we've got a bunch of exciting stuff coming to the sheriff's office. Our domestic violence dedicated, our dedicated DV team is is getting up and running. Um, a lot of the things that we're still struggling with are just the staffing stuff. Um, a lot of union negotiations come back to staffing, staffing. And so uh, it slowed things down a little bit. It's not, it's not running as fast as I want it to, but we are making the progress that we wanted to see there. Um, and I think the biggest thing has just been the, the retaining of employees. Um, we're currently in support um, contract negotiations um, with our, our, uh, our civilian staff. And um, obviously our, our position to negotiate as the sheriff's office is more on the workplace conditions, um, but we feel that like that's been going really well. Conditions. Um, we're offering flexible scheduling for our, our civilian staff. We are offering telework options for our civilian staff um, because our competitor in that area isn't Pierce County or Lacey Police Department, it's the state of Washington. That's who we're competing with. We are competing with higher salaries. We're competing with a state that is offering full time telework, um, which is alleviating daycare issues for people. Um, we've lost a significant number of civilian staff to the state of Washington. So we are. Um, really, really working to try and improve um, the work-life balance of our employees across the board. So those are kind of the things that are going on um, within the sheriff's office. Um, another thing that's that's kind of led to our, our overtime expenditures is that um, we've also, we have opted to not fill our detective positions. Um, so we have a number of vacant detective positions that are still sitting vacant. Um, and that is to alleviate the, the overtime on patrol as well. So um, our detectives are working twice as hard with half the bodies. Um, our patrol division is down bodies, but we're not, we're not stealing from them to, to staff the detectives. Um, we've got a lot of mandatory, and you guys know this as well as I do, we have a lot of mandatory training that is unfunded that we are trying to cover internally. Um, I just learned today that Washington uh, State Criminal Justice Training Academy and the legislative have created a new discipline of training called Patrol Tactics. This position is mandatory training with no funding behind it. Um, the only funding that we get is to send our, our, our basically our train the trainers to the academy. But then once they come back, every single employee has to go through it every three years. Um, so again, you talk about training, you talk about overtime and making time for all this stuff. The unfunded mandates are absolutely killing um, local government. So um, the other problem that we're having is uh, it's not a secret that violent crime is continuing to trickle up in the state. Um, we have had 13 SWAT callouts in four months, which is pretty much unprecedented. And that is causing a significant amount of not only overtime, but we are spending a lot more money getting these people to come out uh, peacefully. So while it's great that obviously we don't want anyone to be killed in these incidents, I just want it to be clear that we are spending a ton of money to get that peaceful surrender. We're having to send more tear gas into houses. We're having to use more flashbangs. Um, we are spending a lot more time talking with people. And, you know, the dollars are, are counting out every hour when you've got 25 people 
ranging from SWAT operators to crisis negotiators on a scene trying to get someone to come out of their house after they've committed a violent crime, um, that's causing a significant amount of overtime to be spent. Um, to keep it in context, we've had 12 SWAT callouts in the first quarter. That is generally how many SWAT callouts we would have in an entire year. Um, so we are experiencing a year's worth of violent, serious violent crime SWAT callouts um, in one quarter. And so we are hoping that that would slow down, but the trend currently is that that will be, you know, three times the amount of, of SWAT call-outs that we generally have, and those are, those are high liability. <laughs> um, the other thing that we're seeing is that the average age of the deputies has decreased significantly over the years. Um, we've had a lot of turnover in our, in our older ranks, and the younger age has more deputies in the family building stage, which means that we have a lot more deputies out on FMLA and childcare and all these other things. So... Um, whereas you would see more senior deputies, obviously, not really having children at 50, 45 to 55 years old. Um, you've got a lot of deputies having kids at the 20 to 30-year-old um, age range. So um, that, is, that is kind of the, the big meat and potatoes of the, of the updates for the sheriff's office. But I think I'd rather get to any specific questions that you guys might have on some issues that I might be. Oh, legislative stuff. Um, the, it's pretty much status quo for our pursuit bill. Um, so we were tracking that pretty closely. So things are going to stay exactly how they are pretty much. They've added assault fourth degree domestic violence to the list of crimes that we'll pursue for. We'll update that. Um, the second one that is maybe more impactful is that the drug bill that seemed to have a lot of bipartisan support has failed, um, which means that without a special session, all jurisdiction will go to local government. Um, for drug possession and drug enforcement in Thurston County. I will, if, if the governor does not call a special session, hard narcotics will be completely legalized in the state of Washington on July 25th. There will be a sunset phase where fentanyl, open use of fentanyl will have zero repercussions. Um, I would call on the county commission, as all local jurisdictions will then have authority up to misdemeanor crime, um, to adopt the um, the bill that was proposed, um, which is a gross misdemeanor for drug possession at the county level um, with a substantial encouragement into diversion and treatment over enforcement. Um, that is what I would recommend to the board. Uh, I have some serious concerns about um, drug possession, open drug possession being completely legalized in this state, um, especially at a time where fentanyl overdose is the leading cause of death in our county and in this state. So, um, we have a lot of concerns with that. I am actively recruiting the cities to join our Thurston County Narcotics Task Force. Um, it seems unfortunate to me that when you have drug overdose being the leading cause of death, we have a narcotics task force. The structure is there, and the only participating agency is Thurston County Sheriff's Office. Um, over 60% of the overdoses occurred within the city limits of Olympia, and our narcotics detectives have reported to me they spend most of their time in the city limits um, within this county, not in unincorporated county. So um, we're fighting this battle. It's not a battle that I think can only be, it's not just a hammer. Um, you've got to have the treatment and stuff, but I, it's foolish for us to think that there isn't a role for enforcement to play um, in, this, in this work. So um, they're doing a great job. They're consistently making um, high-end dealer busts. And, and so we're going to continue to support them. Obviously, that's a self-funded entity. They, they, they don't rely on hardly any taxpayer funding. They, they self-fund themselves through civil asset forfeiture of drug dealers. So those are kind of the things that, are, that we're tackling um, with the legislative session. Unfortunately, the bill that was targeted at um, recruiting and retention of police officers failed almost immediately. There was a bill that was going to allow counties to receive a, a sales tax credit. Um, so no new taxes. It would basically just it would take a small a small fraction of sales tax out of the state. Um, that bill failed, um, and so we were really hoping to get some money for commercial production, recruiting, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it is it is very much status quo when it comes to law enforcement um, in the legislative session, and there is still um, some conversation. I know that. They want some of the True Blood money for the mental health um, stuff to be utilized in the jail, and we will continue to adamantly oppose um, legislative, legislative ideas that mental health treatment should occur in Thurston County Jail. We do not believe that that's a therapeutic session or a therapeutic setting for people to receive mental health treatment. Um, we believe that standalone facilities should be the ones offering mental health treatment in counties. 
um, especially as we see the decommission of Western State Hospital and all these other things, um, there's we, we continue to, to drive full speed ahead of the mental health crisis in this state and in this country. Um, and so we're going to continue to adamantly oppose any, I mean, Thurston County is already the largest mental health facility in Thurston County. Uh, the jail is already the largest mental health facility in the county. Um, and it's, it's a high liability for our, our corrections deputies. They're not trained for it. Um, and it's just something that they kind of get defaulted into as a last resort. So that is my super cheerful update um, to the county commission. In the reality of things, though, um, I would say that the, the morale of the department has increased tenfold. Um, we've retained every deputy that I've wanted to retain. We've just had some retirements is essentially what we've faced. Um, but it's, it's allowed us, our recruiters are doing a fantastic job of getting our lists full. Um, our social media presence has really played a factor in that. Um, our recruiter at the jail says that when she goes out to events, people are like, oh, I, I follow all of you guys on social media and our, our lists are filling up um, as far as people who want to come work here. So I'm excited about that, and I, there is a lot of optimism coming to the sheriff's office. So, yeah. Questions, Commissioner Edwards. Well, I sit on the risk pool, and the risk pool is very concerned about when we talk about cutting back on training or more exposure for whatever reason, uh, whether that be in the jail or on the road. So, uh, what did we have to pay? A million dollars more recently. Something goes to be all a bunch. I can only anticipate it's going to keep going up if we more keep. More coming. Huh? An additional increase is coming this yeah. year. And uh, and it's going to keep coming, and it's going to be worse if we don't adequate fund adequately fund some of these responsibilities laid out by the sheriff. So. Just uh, just some things that were cut. Um, so dive training. So we have dive rescue members who will not receive training through uh, June um, for their efforts. Obviously, that's some some high risk stuff because they're doing all the high high angle rope rescues and things like that. So their training has been canceled. Um, our deputies will not receive any defensive tactics training um, through through June. So when they're out handcuffing people and taking people into custody, they won't receive training for that. Uh, we will not be sending deputies to our Metro Collision Reconstruction, um, which is obviously their ability to reconstruct fatal collisions and serious injury, or injury collisions. Um, we are down to, I think, just one or two who are actually capable of doing that. So, um, And we've also cut our Marine Services basic hours. So that one's becoming problematic because, as we've reported hopefully in the past, I wasn't here, but for the last two years our staffing has been so poor that we haven't met the Washington state's limits for boating hours. Um, we have to make so many, we don't write tickets, but we have to make a certain amount of contacts. Well, because we haven't allocated an actual deputy put that, to that position for two years, the state has said that if we do not meet our hours this year, they will cut all our funding for um, our boater program, which is obviously fairly important. So this year we are dedicating that deputy no matter what, even though we know it's gonna hurt staffing a little bit. However, we're not sending any additional deputies to that training. So um, we've canceled our Marine services um, we have also um, canceled SWAT training, um, which is a tough one to cut, but it saved $4,000 just because we're having all these violent SWAT callouts, but now our SWAT team is not going to be training as often um, to try and cut back on the overtime. Because the last thing I want to do is come back at the end of the year um, to a giant overtime bill for you guys. And when you ask me what we've done to try and correct it, I'll tell you nothing. So we have made these cuts. Um, it is a fluid thing where we're looking at it month to month. Um, and we're also canceling our executive level trainings as well. So anything, if it, if it can be allocated to the jail, there's funding for that. If it's patrol related, it's being canceled. All of the trainings are important, but didn't the, um, didn't the county pay a fine a few years back levied by L&I for inadequate dive training? No, I don't. You don't recall that? Maybe it's longer. I'll have to look back. But, but, but because I know problem. that we were fined by L and I related to inadequate training for our divers. But, but more than that it fine might have been before my time. Me, not the sheriff, but that is an L and I requirement and we could pay more than the cost of the training if we're fined by L and I. 
Well, uh, I, I want to mention that it's not going to be the fine that's the problem. It's going to be you have one of those officers that doesn't come back up. Well, yeah. Then yes. you've the got risk. the litigation. Absolutely. That's, that's millions of dollars. Right. And that's the kind of thing that the risk pool the is, is so very concerned life, about. So. And like I said, we're just at an apex right now where the positions are filling up and we're losing the vacancy savings. It's good and bad at the same time. We're just in a tough spot right now. Um, you know, the jail has lots of money because they have vacancies, but we don't want vacancies. At, at some point, there's just this apex where they're just not on the road yet, but they're hired. So we're, we're doing everything we can to get those positions filled so the overtime isn't isn't so bad. But right now, it's just we're at the worst of it. How are you putting on job fairs like up at Fort Lewis? Oh, yeah. uh, we've done, with the recruiter stuff, we have wrapped their vehicles. So our vehicles are now custom wrapped with, like, join the sheriff's office. We put QR codes on the side of the vehicles so that as passengers drive by, they can scan it. It takes them to a job application. Um, they are handing out all sorts of, what's that? Passengers. <laughs> passengers. <laughs> passengers. Um, we are adding. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We are uh, reflection commissioner. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, 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 no. It would be the passenger of a vehicle who could safely not distract their driver. Um, we are adding little QR codes to the back of our patrol vehicles so people can scan the back. I mean, we we are doing everything we can. To, every event that I go to, um, I am actively recruiting everyone I can. So at the night out event, I got a I got a lateral to apply from McCleary. So at, at every event. I am out here trying to steal, and I'm constantly plotting, but it's just we're, we're at this apex where it's just expensive. Um, so we want to cut back as best we can. At the same time, the training areas, it hurts a little bit because we want well-trained, well-equipped deputies, but there's just, we don't know where else to cut, so. I would, on the Blake bill, yeah. so if we get into a, if we get into a position where there's no special session and this previous law sunsets and, you know, you're calling for, and I'm sure there will be others calling for, you know, local action, um, and I'm inclined to lean, you know, your direction in terms of, like, let's take the key elements of what they almost passed, you know, right. Um, but a good piece of that scheme involved diversion and treatment and all that stuff. So we have less capacity potentially to manage that locally. So, and to get it, to do the best we can, I think we need to be coordinated across all of our jurisdictions if, if we're in that position. So I guess what I'm saying is, and I'm sure that, you know, you've thought about this, but if you're talking with your co, co you know, colleagues yeah. in the cities and stuff, like I'm going to feel a lot better about moving forward yeah. on that. If, we're all, if we talk this through, Commissioner Mejia has already suggested we put this front and center at Law and Justice Council if we need to, you know, um, that's a great forum to kind of hash out between the jurisdictions. Let's do this together because we're going to need to do it together if we're going to actually going to be able to administer and fund the, the treatment and diversion part of the whole system that was that was contemplated. Does that make sense to you? I agree. Yeah. Uh, that's the only way I think that it can succeed. I don't. This is. I don't think this is something. A patchwork of all these little like cities and counties to having different drug laws is going to be, I think, a mess. Yeah. And and you know, frankly, like I I know that there was so much debate over a misdemeanor versus a gross misdemeanor. I truly don't care. It just can't be completely legal. Um, I think that's kind of where the community is at. I think that all lawmakers kind of got to that point. It's disappointing to see that it didn't pass and that there wasn't some sort of because when I talk around, even with other law enforcement officials, like those aren't the details that we really care about. Um, whether it's a misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor, it, it kind of all means the same thing at the end of the day because the point isn't that they're going to jail. The point is that there's just teeth at the end of it to make sure that people have an incentive to go to treatment. And, and when you've got, if, when that issue is the breaking point legislatively, then obviously there was a consensus for it to be criminalized as a misdemeanor. Yes. Um, so the result that we're getting as a result of that impasse, doesn't reflect community will or legislative will either. So yeah, that's yeah, it's too bad that you know five five three six had good good legislation behind it. It really wasn't. You know, it just came down to the the gross misdemeanor versus a simple misdemeanor. Extremely disappointed how that turned out to be. Absolutely. Yeah, and I just I, my my own personal opinion is that a misdemeanor is just fine. Um, when you looked at and 
and maybe the best part about that bill on the back end of things after treatment failed was it had mandatory minimums inside of it. And those, but those mandatory minimums weren't 364 days in jail, a gross misdemeanor. They were 20 days in jail, 40 days in jail. It, it scaled as things got worse. And so, um, I don't know, personally, I would have, I would have been more than happy to say it's a, it's a misdemeanor. It's an arrestable offense. Um, but the idea here is to get people clean and, and into treatment because we all recognize, I think, I hope everyone recognizes that the war on drugs failed. So. Okay, thank you. Um, my questions is in regards to the academy capacity. Um, you mentioned it's not until 2024, and so you have kind of just all these, you're in a holding pattern. And I'm wondering why that is, right? We've had this, I know everyone's been hiring all over the place. Um, and I would think there would, there would be that academy capacity. Did it just go down as they weren't, there weren't hirings as much across the state or? No, um, just like the courts, they're seeing a backlog from COVID. Um, so there was a, there was a phase where things got backed up, and in order for the academy to make up lost time, they went from, I mean, when, when I was up at the academy, the building's still the same. They've added, they've added no new infrastructure. You could probably, I mean, it felt busy up there when we were running about five classes, six classes. Sometimes you'd be like, ah, two classes can't use the range at the same time, and you'd run into issues. I believe they're running 12 currently, 12 classes up at the academy. I mean, they have, and recruits are coming back and reporting to us that, there are times where they just miss an entire period because there's only one instructor assigned to two class class times. Um, so they'll just sit there and do nothing for two hours for an entire block. Um, so we're at the we're at the point where the state has just not properly addressed the academy. Um, I know Monica Alexander. She runs CJTC. She is trying as hard as she can. A lot of it has to do with infrastructure. Um, they could probably get the the instructors, but the academy is an old church that they acquired in like the year of 2000. Um, it has long since been surpassed. So they are trying to get the state to buy her a new facility. Um, but, you know, it's just the state runs even, it's just a slow, it's a slow ordeal. And so um, it, before it always seemed like a problem, it would take about three or four months to get people in. But usually what you saw is that when agencies give conditional offers to employees, you can technically get your academy slot for that person. So what would happen is an agency would give a conditional offer to Commissioner Menser and say, you know, your academy dates in four months, we're going to get you slotted. But then if Mincer fails his polygraph test or fails a psychological, well, then they call the academy back and tell them that di disregard, sorry. And so it opened up positions. And so what you're seeing now is just, it's just a backlog. It's going backwards. So I don't know why. Um, there has been significant turnover in law enforcement. And so it might just be that there is starting to be an upswing in hiring for everyone and the academy can just not keep up with the, with the demand. Uh, but this has been escalating for quite some time. Again, it felt full when I was there seven years ago. So they haven't cut it, but they haven't addressed it in any way. It's basically just status quo. And, meanwhile, they need everything. and so, and I, I think too, what you saw for a little bit there is that um, when all the laws changed in 2021, you saw a lot of resignations, people moving out of state, well, after time goes on, people could become acclimated, and so you start seeing more people apply again. I think there was a lull where we weren't really getting new. It was really a struggle to get new recruits to even apply. And now that things have kind of normalized and we've had time to train on things and understand them better, you're starting to see an, ups, an uptick in, in applications. Um, but the, the state has just done a really poor job of, of anticipating that. Um, so. Thank you. Um, and then... So how long is the Corrections Academy? Are, is there issues with, with that training as well? Well, they all train in the same building, um, but they seem that seems to be kind of incorporated into their, into their um, training. The difference between corrections and patrol is that corrections can go work in the jail without being CJTC certified. So you can bring a corrections deputy on board and immediately give them a uniform and have them start their field training. And then once their academy date opens up, they can be sent. And their academy date is, is two months long, uh, as opposed to five and a half. Actually, I think patrol's up to six months now. So um, that's kind of the big difference, I think, that you see between the two professions is that we can get corrections staffed much quicker. The, the, the conundrum, of course, is that patrol is easier to recruit for, and it's easier to fill. More people are interested in that career right now. Um, 
but it takes longer to get them on the road. Corrections is much easier to get through the academy and get them working, but less people are applying. So we kind of have both ends of the, of the stick there. And so, but it is a shorter academy time. We can get them working quicker. We can get them on the job training quicker. Um, one of the things that we are entertaining currently is lowering the age of our corrections deputies to 18. Um, it's one of those things where my philosophy is that you don't have to hire any of them, but to not give any of them a fair look might be a disservice to what we're trying to do in, in recruiting people. And it also would give us a nexus to recruiting the high schools and also, also offer some sort of law enforcement for 18 to 21 year olds. Um, so we're, we are looking at everything we can possibly think of to improve our applicant pool there. I'm wondering what these conditional offers that you're making to your patrol services be like, come at the deal for now. Fill in for a year while your academy spot opens up for patrol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had some union battles with that because we've been, we've been discussing different things like that. And the unions really want their classified work protected. So, <laughs> um, But we are starting to save money now because we recognize that we don't necessarily need to hire them immediately and let them sit here for eight months um, when no one else can get their people in either. So. Well, um, I'm happy to hear about that device that tracks fentanyl in the air. I think that's pretty, pretty great, especially as we've seen all these deaths in our in our own jail and just having the extra level of security is good. Um, and in terms of the female corrections deputies, we will be having a planning session. Uh, this Friday, and where I will be discussing kind of what we've discussed in, in terms of child care and um, bringing that to, to the commissioners. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and then, Robin, you said you were going to find out about that L&I training. Yeah, I'll, I'll find look and see what that was. Okay. Um, Could I just comment on that? Yeah. Whether it's L and I finds or we increase the training ability, it's going to be expensive for us to do for it us. either way. But you end up with a, a death involved in the whole thing I know. because of a lack of training. Then you've really got problems. And then what about our insurance rates? And so <clears throat> we need to think about prioritizing our spending. Well, and as we come into the 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 budget cycle for requests and things like that. I know, I think it was maybe two years ago, um, the sheriff requested an increase in budget for training, um, which was approved by the county commission, which was super important. Um, but we have the money to send people to the training. Um, that, that cost is covered. What we're struggling with right now is obviously just the overtime associated with sending people to training um, because you have to pay them. We're trying to give them like adjusted days off, but what you're finding is that the staffing is still so low that you give someone an adjusted day off and then you pay the overtime for the shift they were supposed to work. So we've, we're trying to get people like overlap, like, and, and we've also looked at trying to give adjusted days off on our overlap days. Um, but you just run out of days. Eventually you run out of, you run out of days that you can give people off where you're just paying the overtime anyways. So, um, it's, it's mostly coming down to the, to the overtime, um, budget is what's, is what's constraining. It, we have plenty of money to send people to the training. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that we've been doing too with the, um, with the overtime, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, for the actual, um, I forgot what I was going to say. I lost my train of thought. The backfill issue. Well, the, the backfill issue, it, it just, it's coming down to just the, the overtime budget, but there was something else that we did to mitigate the overtime. Um, I lost my train of thought. That makes me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. More, more to come. More to come. <laughs> I got a couple grays coming in here. <laughs> I bet. Um, yeah, uh, again, it, it sounds grim a little bit just because we're talking about the, the overtime budget and whatnot, but... Um, it's, it's also a sign of things improving, in my opinion. I, I think that if we wouldn't be having this conversation if we were still down 20 patrol positions because we'd be like, well, we had the vacancy, so we know we're going to have the vacancy savings. Um, so 
Yeah, I think. Oh, I was just going to talk about um, budget requests. Uh, but I think that that was the other thing that we've been doing too. For instance, we had two fatality. I mean, I was involved in a collision. There were three or four non-injury collisions. Then we had two fatal collisions um, out on Bald Hill Road, Lawrence Lake area. Um, and so those are kind of the tough things where on one hand, we're making budget cuts to, on our overtime. On the other, like it's really difficult for me to sit back and do nothing when people die and when speeding is going unchecked. Um, when you look at our patrol districts, I'm just going to go on a small rant. I explain to people how big these districts are for one deputy to cover. Um, so everyone is like, why is there no traffic enforcement on Bald Hill Road? And then I draw them a picture of our Edward district, and they're like, that makes sense. Never mind. Um, and so we, I just, it was difficult for me to sit back and do nothing as people are like <clears throat> speeding around corners and failing to negotiate the corner and going head on with other cars. We got hit and run fatals where people are street racing and getting picked up by their buddies after they kill someone. Like we ended up opening up some overtime um, opportunities for deputies to go out and do traffic enforcement. But in those situations, we also reached out to Target Zero and got funding through the grant um, to open up. I think almost all of those positions were opened up via the grant funding. So um, we're trying to find like grant funding and different things like that to offset overtime costs that I think are also absolutely necessary for the community. You can't have two fatal collisions in three days and then not go do anything about it. Um, it's just, that's, I'm, I'm trying to problem solve a little bit um, with finding extra sources for that funding. I also wanted to thank you um, for your assistance and getting the message out in regards to traffic zones and for having um, a sheriff's deputy uh, sit there and we heard from uh, Public Works Director Jennifer Walker, and I know she was very thankful for it because um, she said it definitely, the temperature came down, uh, that they were seeing a lot of uh, situations where things were escalating and, um, and, and kind of that whole area, construction areas, and I know they can be very frustrating for the public, uh, but she was very thankful that there was a deputy there and she said that the temperature definitely came down, so it did help. And, and, I and a few tickets along the way. Yeah, I mean, we did, because that next week, we used funding from Public Works to do a construction zone emphasis, and we got great feedback from them. They said that people were driving slower, and then obviously the ones who were going 50 and a 20 through the construction zones were cited. Um, we're at a point with our agency, our, our deputies are young, which means that they don't have a problem working the overtime. That's not what's killing morale or anything like that. So they're more than willing, any time that Public Works will authorize, you know, some money to do traffic enforcement, we've got the bodies to do that. We had some difficulty with that when I first got hired on and our, our deputy age was older because they just want to go to work, go home and enjoy, enjoy time off. Um, we've got a lot of young gung-ho deputies that love that work. It's just about finding the funding for them to go out and do it. So... Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, and Sheriff. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Okay, let's go ahead and, and take a break. It's 11 11. Yes, thank you. <laughs>
We are back from break. It is 11.30 a.m. We left off with PRPC, UGM. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, uh, letters included in your packet. There was a request from the TRPC, that's the Thurston Regional Planning Council. They are requesting a, uh, 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 an elected official, a commissioner, in, uh, in, uh, in alternate, to serve on the Urban Growth Management UGM subcommittee. And this is uh, related to a, uh, an item. The Thurston County is going to be presented to this committee. Uh, and the result of the, the deliberations of this committee um, will be uh, sending a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners for further action. The, um, there is not a long-term commitment. This committee is planning to meet um, up to two times mm -hmm. to hear this proposal, and that can be probably done in the spring uh, in perhaps early summer. So that is the request from TRPC. Um, and I'd like to see what commissioners raises their hand to participate on this committee. And again, it's going to be probably an hour, uh, two hours uh, commitment, but uh, we need to respond to this. Not everyone at once, commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is this kind of a, a continuation of what they tried to do with that, uh, gosh, we had kind of a statewide committee there. No, this is very specific to the Grand Mound area. With the Grand Mound um, sub area plan, there is a request to uh, do some small revisions to UGA. So this committee serves as a clearinghouse before the board can consider taking an action. And it has to be for the UGA for. Yeah, it's, it's a specific. This is, this is a specific to the Grand Mound area sub, uh, sub area plan. So that is that is only two meetings, and like to participate, and eventually that will the recommendation of that committee will subcommittee will come to the board for further action. And who all is going to be on the committee? Is uh, represents from the cities, uh, elected officials from the cities as from well. From all the cities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is I, I need to understand what this is. So the. This is our Grand Mound sub area plan docket item, the UGA expansions, and there's more than one. They talk about it as if it's a single proposal. It's a single proposal, I, as I understand it. There's only a it's the Grand three, Mound. Three, right? Four. There's four requests to expand the UGA as part of the Grand Mound sub area plan. Maybe it's some different areas. And then we're allowed to do that, and then, and then I think we vote on those proposals as county commissioners. Do we have to take the recommendation of that committee? No. You legislatively, you can concur within the recommendations, reject or change it. I mean, you have the power. It's kind of like a special planning commission with respect to UGA right. expansions. Yeah. Is that kind of the that idea? Is the, um, yeah. Because you're involving the cities, because the cities are involved in. And Chris is coming, um, yeah, so she can probably further elaborate. Hey, Chris, there's some questions on, on, on this subcommittee. Good morning. For the record, Christina Chapeau, Community Planning Manager. I did not hear the question as I was interrupted. Well, I was just, we, we were just kind of going over kind of how the specific, I understand what the committee is about, but the specifics of what they're proposing are the pieces of our Grand Man Subway plan that require UG expansions, and I believe there's four of those. There's three of them. Three of them. And so we would be, we as a commissioner would be sitting on a committee with the cities, whether to make recommendations back to ourselves as Board of County Commissioners. Right. Um, and, then, and then Commissioner Edwards asked whether or not the, the board is, what, what's the binding nature? Like if they say no, nope, that's, do they get veto power or do they? No, they do not. It's a recommendation like, just like the planning commission. That's kind of where we were at. Yep. So it, it really is your legislative it can accept any recommendations and, or not. So volunteers. I think, I think Commissioner <laughs> Airwoods is volunteer for that. Well, I mean, I go. I, I, I would. I mean, I, I thought maybe it, uh, it's his district. I'm going to let him say for. Why are the dates? Like, that's kind of for me, like. Yeah, it's, it's coming up in, in May, the first meeting. That's why they're trying to find the people so that they can get the dates. Okay. I mean, 
Can we defer our designation until we get those? Because I'm really, like, I'm overextended in general, and I'm really, I've, I've got work-related travel and different things going on, so I don't want to volunteer and then not be available. Can time, we... time is of the essence, though. Uh, they really need an appointment, uh, uh, a representative. If, if your schedule is not allowed to that commitment, want an, we have... We have... want somebody nominated for the position and an alternate? Yeah. Well, I'll be the alternate. Oh, I was going to say, okay, but I'll, I'll okay, be, I'll, you, whatever, whatever. I'll work with you on it. I mean, so. Yeah, that's the point is, to, is having a, a main appointment and an alternate so we can work through the schedules. But so the, you, the, the, the sense I mean, of urgency is, I'm just thinking that's what I bring in this item today. Uh, in, in Yelm or something, I'd be more inclined, you know, to yeah. jump in and take it and then, but. If you want, I'll do whatever kind of bails you out on it. I just wanted you to have the option of. No, I appreciate uh, that. And under different circumstances, I mean, I really want to. If you can't go, then I'll go. Between the two of us, we ought to be and able to figure it out. They can't go, then I, I'll go. Commissioner McKee, saving the world. I'll be the third option. <laughs> so, what I'm hearing is uh, Commissioner Menser and you as an alternate. Yeah, it works. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, I'll try to make it work. Yeah. I well, so. yeah, and if if it's something where, you know, then I'll try to go. Like I'm, I think we'll have a commissioner there. Is what I'm trying to say. And whatever. So let's go to to start with Commissioner Menser and then Commissioner Edwards is an alternate. Thank you. But if, if if the dates come and I know up front, I mean, we don't want to split. I think. I want to meet, like if I'm not available for any piece of what they're proposing, I'm going to f ask you to step in. I appreciate that. Because I don't want to go to one and then you have to no, step in at no, another. That will not be beneficial to the process. So either one commissioner commits to one to two, three meetings yeah. or the alternate. Uh, but, you know, splitting the meetings will not be fruitful. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, great. So you, so you will be responding respond. every time. Okay, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you both. When are, when, when are you leaving, Chris? May 12th. May 12th. Okay. Gonna have a big party for you, go? <laughs> Did you hear Sarah over there? She was like, oh, same date as me. <laughs> <laughs> we can combine them. Yeah. Where's Chris going? Yeah. She's going to Pier 10. Yeah, Chris, yeah, she's going to Pier 10. Okay, uh, salary commission appointments. Um, this is an action and this is for the appointments that expired and so the auditor has gone through. Yeah, they, thank you. It's a, uh, it's a sense of urgency, since those appointments, in, you may need to take an action before the end of this month. So with your concurrence, I would like to amend the proposed action um, um, to include after the award district three, uh, comma, and reappoint carry Brandon, uh, as business representative to the Thurston Carey, Brandon. 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 W at the end. R A N D A W? Yeah. E O W? As business representative to the, and then the next of the motion for me. Okay. Um, so ready for a motion, Andrew? Yes, I'm ready for a motion. Uh, I move to appoint Judith Oliver from District 1, William Thomas from District 2, and Eric Agina from District 3, and reappoint Carrie Ra Randow as business representative to the Thurston County Salary Commission for elected officials. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I'll call for the vote. Commissioner Edward? Aye. Commissioner Rinser? Commissioner Mejia? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Motion passes and the appointments to the Salary Commission are approved. Okay. Uh, we have an executive session next. Are there any commissioner uh, items that commissioners would like to discuss? You mean be before our executive session? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just real quickly. 
the issue over at the Tumwater House that we bought for that's been percolating. Joe's working on that. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that nobody's moved in yet. They have not made a selection of any of the clients yet. And uh, uh Mr. Mejia is not tracking on this, maybe a little bit of a perspective. For the uh the TM. The, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In, in, in the board approved TST money to purchase this home. To purchase home, the house. Uh, the, okay. For the first yeah. Up, up yeah. place in Tumwater. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And there, there, there will be no residents in there from outside of Thurston County. They're, they're not bringing somebody like down from Seattle or somebody's, however many it's going to be. They're going to try to look towards, uh, maybe having three females in that particular house. If they can figure it out, that would alleviate some of the concerns. Uh, but also, if I may, I think it was a misunderstanding from the, at least what I took as a public feedback, they're uh, drawing a parallel to the Supreme Living. Oh yeah, nothing, of, uh, not even close. Type of, uh, you know, residents, which is totally different. Okay. It's totally different, so it's not even close to that. And, and Joe's been working with those folks okay. over there. So he's kind of staying on top of it, and he'll be communicating with you, I think, on it as well. So appreciate that. nothing really new other than they're focused on it. And they know okay. it's a community issue, and it's not like there's been any complaints. It's strictly what's going on, you know, type of a thing. Because okay. I when I thought there was some problem, you know, with some of the participants or something. But the they haven't even selected them yet. No, the gentleman who reached out, and I don't know if it's the apples and oranges, but to say around the corner or whatever, they had a, some type of group home situation. Again, maybe the same, maybe different, but there had been problems, and now this one was coming across the street, and he was worried it would be the same kind of situation, and I really didn't know what to say other than to try to get more information from, from Joe at OHRS. And... Uh, one other thing, the Salmon Recovery Funding Group is going to be participating with the Nisqually Tribe, I think, the first week in June. You can get the particulars on it, and it'll be like a day-long, uh, or most of the day, anyway, field trip. And that group that <clears throat> is instrumental in the funding, and I, I don't know if it fits with that other group you're meeting with, or not, you know, if it's that group or if it's strictly the funding group. And I thought you ought to be aware of that because it'll fit. It'll fit your situation. It's an early June day. Yeah. Field trip. Yeah. And it's the Nisqually Tribe and a salmon recovery group, but you're not sure which one. It's the funding group. And I didn't surfboard know if you're... maybe? Salmon recovery funding board? Yes, funding board. Surfboard, they call it. Yeah, but is that, I didn't know if I'm that not was on your surfboard. group. No, that's oh, not my group. Oh, okay, so I thought maybe that might fit with maybe you. Maybe I can crash the party. You know, well, no, no, that, no, that's why yeah. you would fit in good. To, yeah, no, it'd be good to see. To be there on that. I'll follow up. So I don't have the date wrote down. I'm, I do have the date, but uh, Robin's got I'll follow up with uh, Robin. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Uh, speaking of field trips, uh, Monday, uh, taking a field trip with DNR. We all are? <coughs> your okay. schedule. Okay. Bring your so boots. If it's on the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Are you going? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, well, not. Not commissioner attire, but no commissioner attire, <laughs> hiking attire for hiking commissioners. Boots. Rain boots, probably. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe the weather will be. The weather there. might be nice. It seems to be changing. It's right Sunday. Change period. It looks like on changes the changes every five minutes right now. Okay, um, okay. Let's go into executive session. We're going to executive session um, for RCW forty two point thirty point one one zero subsection one i to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency litigation or potential litigation to which the agency, the governing body, or member acting in official capacity is or is likely to become a party. DSHS response regarding LRAs. And this session will take approximately 30 minutes and commissioner's action may follow.
afternoon. We're back from executive session. We were in executive session for RCW 42.30.110, subsection 1i, to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency litigation or potential litigation to the agency. The governing body or a member acting in an official capacity is or is likely to become a party. DSHS response regarding LRAs. Um, it is 1221 and no commissioner's action follows. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you.